men. <laughs> a lot of the trophies were formed by men. A lot of the stories and history books uh, were formed by men as well. And so we thought that what was missing was women's stories, women's, uh, women's network, um, just coming together and supporting other rowers and supporting women as professionals in the workforce. And so we started Women of the Row and it's been pretty successful so far. We've had close to 100 women come to our Boathouse Row events, um, supporting other women. We started collecting stories thanks to um, Gabby, Kara, back there, other women who really just wanted to um, put down these women's stories in the history books, put some women um, photos up on the wall. We have this awesome um, display, thanks to PGRC and Sophie. And so we thought with the um, Title IX, the 50th anniversary approaching, that we wanted to also talk about women athletes in the workforce, in the workplace. And so I'm really excited to introduce our speaker and panelists. We have two awesome speakers who I really look up to, Katherine Carlson and Ashley Dabb. Katherine will be speaking first, so let me read a little bit about Katherine and then we can have her come up here. So Katherine, you may have seen her in the Wall Street Journal. She was featured for being a woman leader in a male industry. Katherine Carlson is the Senior Vice President of Revenue and Strategy at the Philadelphia Eagles and a former rugby athlete. Having worked her way up from an intern at Disney's worldwide, world, wide world of sports to overseeing the development of sponsorships and corporate partners as Alliance <coughs> Development Manager, Katherine went on to spend 11 seasons with the Orlando Magic, becoming Senior Vice President of corporate partnerships and premium activation before leaving to join the Eagles. So please join me in welcoming Catherine. Well, thank you, Maura. I appreciate appreciate that. Um, as Maura said, I, I've just started the Eagles. I'm, I'm new to Philadelphia, so I've only been here for uh, for 10 months, and I have the awesome task of uh, overseeing all the revenue for our for our uh, NFL team here in Philadelphia. Um, and then I had also spent um, 11 years with Walt Disney World and um, uh, 11 seasons with the Orlando Magic NBA. So I moved from the basketball to, no, from the mouse to basketball to now football. Um, but I, I, I bring this photo up here because it was, it was a lot of fun doing this with the Wall Street Journal and we were approached by them um, in terms of, this story had been pitched many, many times about, you know, there's women in sports, but this is the real deal. So if you have a look at this picture, you can see five women. So you have the head of legal, our chief of staff, our head of our foundation, our head of marketing and media, and myself, the head of revenue. Um, this is rare. And so the exciting thing was I, I have to give credit to our president, Don Samolsky, because I made the move to move my family here from Orlando you know, a couple of months ago. And when I saw this, I thought, I'm in. Because I know there's so many sports organizations, whether it was rowing, Football, women's sports, there's just this just doesn't happen. And so it was very exciting for me to become involved with an NFL team and also to have this when I walk into the boardroom every Monday morning. So very excited. And I'm um, you know, I don't I don't just have a seat at the table here with the Eagles. I actually feel like I'm shaping the strategy and business and the future of the team, which is such an exciting, incredibly exciting opportunity for me here. Um, but I thought I would um, share my journey. Uh, in the sports industry and how my passion for sports um, sort of parlayed into a, a career in sports management. Um, although I was never a role myself, I, I actually played field hockey for 20 years, um, becoming a coach as well. And I also, you probably guessed from my accent, I come from a very strong rowing nation in Australia. <laughs> So not to brag or anything, but Rowing Australia has over 60,000 participants and 25,000 active members. So um, when I grew up in college, my roommate was a rower and then my, my best friend when I moved to the US was also a rower. So um, not bad for a country that only has 24 million people. So definitely come from uh, knowing your sport very well. Um, so what I thought I'd do is, um, if you can click the next one, 
thought I'd share with you five learnings along my way to surviving and thriving as a woman executive in the sports industry. It's relevant even if not in the sports industry. And some of the things that I've learned along the way, especially being in a very male-dominated industry, um, I think you'll probably, um, there'll be some nodding of the heads out there because um, you'll be appreciating this. So I'm gonna actually go to my first learning. And so I'm gonna sort of walk you through my career a little bit um, because the learnings came as I, I took my, uh, the journey. So I think my first learning is have passion for what you do. You're all here because you have a sim sing singular passion around rowing. I had a passion for sports. And I mean, I work for the Philadelphia Eagles and I don't know, if, even if you're not from here in Philadelphia, the fans in Philly don't get any more passionate than the Eagles fans. <laughs> Uh, especially when we lost last Sunday against the Dolphins. It was not fun coming home on the team plane, trust me. So, um, you know, as you, as you work in sports, um, you probably spend more time, and even as an athlete, you spend more time with your work family or your teammates. And so you better love what you do because, you know, if you're going to spend all this time away from your family and friends, you better love it and be passionate. Um, so... When I started out, I thought, well, what am I going to do in my career? And I was in Australia at the time, in Melbourne, a big rowing city. Uh, they were starting a brand new degree. It was a business degree in sports management. And I thought, this is fantastic. I think I found out what I want to do. I don't want to be a PE teacher. I don't want to, you know, do that. I, I, I want to, like, merge the passion of business and sports. And I thought that was fairly innovative back then. We were the first group uh, back in the early 90s to actually um, partake this degree to take on this degree. And so um, I think the fact that I could marry, mar marry my passion with an actual career path was, I knew I was gonna be loving this. And this, this was 27 years ago. But I put this quote up here um, from Steve Jobs. Um, and I think it really resonates with me is, the only way to do great work is to love what you do. And I think that is relevant in all walks of life, not just in sports. So I'm gonna flip the page if that's okay. Flip the next one. Yeah. Oh, here we go. So my next le learning is perseverance. I distinctly remember when I started out on my sports management degree, my professor. He said this. So think about this. <coughs> half of you in the room will have to work twice as hard to get half as far. I said, what's he talking about? And I looked around the room, he was talking about the women in the room. And I thought, well, well crap. <laughs> this is not a good start to my career. I've chosen sports and my professor is telling me this. Well, I will tell you, 27 odd years later, when I, I did email him the other day, he's still there as the head professor. He hasn't gone anywhere. Um, and I told him, I said, I'm working in the NFL now. I'm sort of, you know, leading the revenue at the Eagles. And his one thing was living the dream. So that was my, my payback. Um, and then, so when I first started in sports, my first real uh, full-time job was in rugby league. I was the only woman in the entire organization. Well, that's interesting. You see rugby league players, they're big dudes. And so our, our job, we had a very small office. Um, it was a state governing body, so not unlike, not unlike um, your state growing organizations. Our, our role in the organization was to grow the sport of rugby league. The challenge, being the only woman in the organization, is every other day, it was like, what does a chick know about rugby league? And I was Jack, like, yeah, I was so sick of that, and so I'd almost shortened my career in rugby league. But you know what, my perseverance kicked in. I said, I'm not gonna let this beat me. So I went out and got my level one coaching certification in rugby league. And so, if you know anything about rugby league, they get down the scrum, so they get down like this, and the one in the middle puts their arms like hooks up here. And that position is called a hooker. <laughs> so it's a bit of fun and games when I was at the only woman in the rugby league coaching certificate, because you know what position they were all putting me in inappropriately. That wouldn't fly in these day and age, but back in then, that's what you had to do. Um, so then, back to, back to my passion. My passion is field hockey. And so while I was working full-time at rugby league, getting paid pittance, as you did in sports back then. Um, I moonlighted on the weekend as a team manager for one of the elite um, hockey teams in the National Hockey League, field hockey. 
Um, and that passion, uh, that moonlighting on the side led me to a full-time job working for the Australian Hockey Association. And that's the national governing body of field hockey in Australia. Um, I was young, I was 22. Do you think I look young now? I looked really young 20 odd years ago. So, um, but I was in charge of running the National Hockey League. Big job for a 22 year old. Um, but once again, it was perseverance. I worked my butt off on the weekends being a manager just so I could have this opportunity to follow perseverance and led me to my first opportunity in a sport that I had such passion for. Then my next, my next learning along the way is you've got to take risks in life. You can't just, you know, say woulda, coulda, shoulda. You've got to take risks. And so the allure of the sports industry in the USA kind of had me hooked. It was very strong. So I packed up two suitcases and I decided that I need to go to the US to further my career. And so I actually um, uh, applied to do a master's degree here in the US at UMass. So. Um, uh, luckily, I got in because that was the only the only one that I there that I applied for. I didn't realize you were supposed to apply for multiple uh, multiple yeah. schools. So, um, so what ended up as a one year um, dream to come and do my master's degree um, ultimately led me to permanently um, relocating here to the U.S. Um, and that was 23 years ago. Uh, so now I'm living the American dream, working in the NFL, married, and I have two equally sports crazed boys. Um, but after, after, um, after, uh, after finishing my degree, I was offered an opportunity to work for Disney, the wide world of sports. They had a huge sports complex down in Disney. And I thought, you know what, I'm not going to go back to America, uh, back to Australia yet. I thought, you know, maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll stick it out and work for a company like Disney and one of the most recognized brands in the world. Well, that one year ended up being an 11 year career at Walt Disney World. Um, just loved working in sports, Disney. I mean, it just doesn't get any better than that. But then about six years into my career at Disney, I took another risk and I got out of sports. I got out of my passions. I'm here, I'm telling you, follow your passion. I got out of sports. But um, I was actually in charge of uh, driving um, sponsorships to the theme parks. It's completely nothing to do with sports. Um, but it allowed me to travel around the world with the Walt Disney World Imagineers. I went to Botswana, South <coughs> Africa, Spain, Canada, Australia. We traveled the world um, building partnerships with um, international firms to, to, to do business with the Walt Disney World. But I put this up here. Um, if someone offers you an amazing opportunity and you're not sure you can do it, say yes and then learn how to do it later. So 11 years into my career at Disney, I was offered a role at the the Orlando Magic. And once again, like rugby league, I didn't really know a lot about basketball. I knew they were tall dudes and they bounced this little orange ball around and they made a ton of money and they owned my billionaires, but didn't really know a lot. So I, I always keep this quote and when I change careers or you know, I talk and mentor women in the industry, um, you know, it's such a great thing. Sometimes just, just take a risk. Don't, don't, don't stay back and go woulda, coulda, shoulda again. Um, one thing I've learned in life is that Men will apply for a job if they're 60% qualified. Women wait till they're like 100%, like, oh my gosh, I can't possibly apply for this job because I'm not qualified. Don't do that. And I advise women, as they, especially younger women, as they're coming up through their career, you know what, they're BSing in the interview too, you might as well as well. And, um, and so it's really important that, it, it, and I see this a lot as I interview and, and I, I try and mentor women, they're just too nervous to take that step and take that risk. But if you never, if you never take the opportunity or just say yes and I'll figure it out later, um, you'll, you'll never get to move on and, and have those opportunities. And then my next advice is, is and it, look, these are, no, these are simple things, but it's just funny when you, you really look back at your career and you realize, wow, I should have done that more. And this one, it goes without saying, network, network, network. Um, so you know how I got the job at the Eagles? I had a recruiter reach out to me on LinkedIn. And because I'm active on LinkedIn, I follow our industry, someone had reached out to me. And I usually don't accept these you know, calls from recruiters, but this sort of caught my attention. So I said, why not? 
but it was because I was active on LinkedIn and this recruiter that had reached out to me, we'd spoken a couple of years previously and she remembered we're having a great conversation and that being a woman executive that I might be just a really good fit for the Philadelphia Eagles. So I put this, I, I put this quote up, it's from a book and I, I, this, reading this book changed my life. It's called Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. And I'm like, what do you mean we don't get the corner office? And it's really interesting because what I found is that there are a lot of behaviors that women um, have in the workplace that you sabotage why you don't get the corner office. And the best example I had, and I probably did it myself, is I was the hardest working, I'd be at the office early, I'd be the last one to leave, I'd be busting my butt to do everything the boss said and you know, do plus plus. But why am I not getting promoted? And my, my colleague, male colleagues are getting promoted, what, what the hell? And so what I realized is that networking was key. And you know what, it's okay to have a water cooler talk. It's okay to drop by your CFO's office and say, hey, what's going on you know, this week? And, and building those relationships. And um, because then you have uncover the opportunities that you didn't, wouldn't have known about if you were down head, head in your office doing all your work. And so one of my um, dear staff, who was, she was the head of um, our business operations, she just couldn't figure out why she wasn't getting promoted. When I gave her this book, she said thank you, because it changed her life as well, and now she's the head lead counsel for the Orlando Magic. So I'm um, really excited about that. Um, the other thing with networking that I've learned in my career um, is I had to learn how to play golf. And this is the, I know that sounds silly, um, but when I, um, you know, I've played field hockey, so I had pretty good hand-eye coordination, ball stick, it can't be that hard. Um, and so I really taught myself how to play golf because what I realized that all my male colleagues would be, um, I was missing out on opportunities because I wasn't on the golf course with them and big deals were happening on the golf course with the guys. I draw the line, I'm not going to smoke a cigar. That is, I'm naturally not going to do that. But um, playing golf has been a really important thing for me and I've had all women staff at various points in my career and we've actually gone out and done golf lessons in the afternoon because um, I think my theory is, is most guys you play with in these corporate golf events, they really suck. <laughs> Most. And if you go out, so here's my tip. First hole, when I go out with four clients, I just really focus and I'm like, I'm going to smack the you know what out of this ball. And I always hit a really good one off the tee the first time. It goes about, I can hit it about 200 yards. And they all go, whoa. <laughs> She's all right. And from that moment on, credibility just goes from here to here. And that's why I keep telling my women staff on my team, don't worry about if you suck. They do too. <laughs> Just hit a couple, play it quickly, we'll go, you'll be good. And so um, I think the athlete in me made sure that playing golf really helped further my career, which sounds so silly, but it is true. All right, the final one. Um, Work-life balance, is, is it possible? Um, a lot of women ask me this question, especially working in professional sports. At this time of the year, during the NFL season, I literally don't have a life. I'm, I'm traveling with the team every weekend. Um, luckily this weekend, we have a Monday night football game, so I have my whole weekend off, which I'm very excited about. But um, if you flip to the next um, one. This is a really cool quote, and um, actually, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this. I got this quote from Charlotte Jones, uh, the daughter of Jerry Jones of the Cowboys. Um, so I was at an event once, and I was actually really impressed with her. Uh, she's a class act. She said, there's no such thing as super, Superman or Superwoman. We all have holes in our cape. So many people truly believe we can have it all. I, be I do believe you can have it all, just maybe not all at once. So I, always, I love this little uh, picture here. <coughs> It was never a dress. I just, that, that's great. I need, to, I need to frame this and put it in my office. Um, but she went on to say that, you know, sacrifices have to be made throughout your life. The give and take that comes with having a family, a successful career may often at times frustrate you. True. Um, leaving you feeling like you're never giving 100%. Understanding and accepting that reality is important for both men and women to manage their own expectations. And being able to justify it to the person staring you back in the mirror is the key to success. So I have two little boys. My husband's on a trip right now. I am juggling. I'm ready to get As soon as we're finished here, i got to run back and get the kids from school. So it's really interesting. I think it's possible. It's just maybe not all at once. Um, I think one of the keys, though, is building your network. 
Um, you know, I'm new to town, so I have to start from scratch again, building my network. I've got neighbors looking after my kids. I've got, I'm trying to figure all this all out, but um, it's possible. You just gotta have a supportive support system in place to make it work, to make it reality. Um, and that's it, I just wanted to share five of my tips. No, I